All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Joshua Sear. For those that don't know me, I'm the new interim director here for the Entrepreneurship Center. I see maybe a couple new faces, but mostly familiar ones, which is excellent. Uh, just a quick shout out for the Entrepreneurship Center and all the events that we do. Thank you to Nicole and DJ, where we wave at the back for all their hard work and putting on these events and more. I want to welcome pre a little bit prematurely our new Associate Director Bell, who's going to be joining us in just a few weeks. Uh, so say hi to her on their way out. She, we're very excited to have her. Um, uh, and one last thing I just want to shout out for you. Uh, not everybody has reached out to me yet to try to do some one-on-one -on -one mentoring. If you've got a project, you have a startup, you have an idea, and you want to talk to someone about it, you want help with a pitch deck or anything in between, reach out to me, reach out to our team. Let's have a great conversation. We're here to help you. Okay. And so without... And any further ado, I want to introduce you to Eric here. Eric is, um, I, I read through your bio, Eric, and he's basically done everything. <laughs> he has a background uh, first as a historian, right? And then as a, as a corporate executive. Uh, he's written multiple books on a variety of topics, entrepreneurship, uh, food, uh, and I'm not going to bore you with it all tonight, weight, but I'll just touch on change, the things that are relevant. To, right? Yeah. Well, what's relevant to me with that, Eric, and what I think is really important here, we have a lot of students that are cross-disciplinary, right? We have students, I think, representing all facets of campus here. It's not just business students. It's not just computer science. It's everyone, right? And so we have someone here that's been so successful that started off as a history student, right? Has gone on for radio and television has been an, become an author and an executive and is, is literally changing people's lives still today. I think that's amazing. And I think that's a great story for our students to understand. So thank you so much for speaking uh, here today and for saying afterwards for some book signings. So make sure you stick around to get a book uh, free. And uh, I'll, t I'll let you take it from Fantastic. Here. Thanks, yeah, thank Joshua. you very much. Thanks, everyone. Well, if, um, if this book were, if I were taking it to the pediatrician every week, it would be a toddler, but because of COVID, it didn't really get this, it's got launched just as COVID got launched. So the kind of thing you would have done with a book, which is get to travel around and sort of talk about it, didn't really happen. So this is nice catch up for me, being able to be in front of a live audience and actually talk about the book. <clears throat> um, when I wrote it, I wrote it with a little bit of anxiety because what sells to entrepreneurs, what sells to most people are lists. People want what we call listicles now, right? I want to know the three things in the morning that I need to do to be successful or to be rich by the end of the day. And I knew what I was planning to write wasn't going to fit very, very neatly into a uh, listicle. Um, I'm a vintage 1980-ish MBA, and this is the book that was our listicle. This came out in 1982. It sold, I think, three million copies in four years. I must have gone to four conferences on this book in the 1980s, um, and that was our list. I don't think that list got me very far. I don't think it made me much money, but that was the list that we had in, in the 1980s. Um, you can't glance at your phone tonight and not see some list of success, right? How do I be more successful tomorrow? Um, we also found out afterwards that a couple of consultants slapped this together just before presentation, turned it into a book. So if it had been in a medical journal and peer reviewed, it never would have seen the light of day. Like most business press, I think you'll find it as you go through it. I, I did in all my research happen to find one list, one listicle that works. You may know this guy, J. Paul Getty. He launched Getty Oil in 1942. He was the richest American in 1957. He has a success formula that works. They used to ask him about it. Number one, rise early, right? That's like Ben Franklin stuff. Number two, work hard. Number three, strike oil, right? <laughs> that is a list that will work for you every time. So that's the one list, okay? At least you've got a recipe for success. So if nothing else clicks tonight, you've got this. So Getty's actually a nice way to sort of introduce what I want to talk to you about, which is how I think you can be or optimize your chances for success as an entrepreneur without having to rely on uh, unreliable listicles. The thing about being an entrepreneur is that by definition, you're going to be asked to solve a problem that nobody has ever solved before. That's the whole point of, of what it is you're doing. And the way I think you optimize your chances for doing that 
is you need to become a student of the industry. You need to become a student of entrepreneurship. And by that, I mean you want to accumulate as many examples and case studies and stories and narratives as you possibly can. And you want these things sort of churning in your head and being integrated all the time so that as you're having your own experiences, you can start to compare those with what it is you've learned about before. And at the right time, maybe once or twice in your career, this will all come together, in a, hopefully, in a very nice way, and you'll make a really good decision about something that has never been solved before. It's what Mark Twain said about history. It doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So that's what we're looking for. We're gonna be looking for the stuff that rhymes. So Innovation on Tap is a collection of these uh, stories, these case studies. They're arranged chronologically. They also have some themes associated with them, but you can dip into any of them. You can read it in any order you want, find a story you like, and you can read that. Um, what I'll do this evening is I'll give you an overview. I'll tell you who's in the book and why you might want to open it. And I'm not going to lecture for 90 minutes. So at about a uh, half hour or 40 minute mark, I've got three or four, four case studies, I call them chats, which we can stop and talk about. I'll tell you some background and we can stop and talk about what's going on with the case study, okay? My bio's in the book. I'm also on LinkedIn, so I'll only touch on uh, some of the highlights. I, I welcome you to link in with me, okay? Consider this our formal introduction, right? Please do. My last full-time position was as CEO of Sensitech, and it was a business that monitors the cold chain. We have someone here who used the product, in fact, which is great. Uh, if you shipped perishable product, food or pharmaceutical, anywhere in the world, haagen ice cream we monitored, we monitored flu vaccine, we monitored Dole strawberries that were coming to Midwest Walmart centers or East Coast stop and shop centers, anything going from south to, east, south to north, so anything coming from Chile into North America, coming from South Africa into Rotterdam. If it was perishable, chances are good that there was a temp tail on it if it came by plane, by sea container, by train, or by truck. We were a venture-backed startup, uh, mostly Boston and New York. When I had a board meeting, that was big. It was 15 or 20 people. So uh, we grew from zero to about 100 million, and then we were acquired by Carrier Corporation. And Carrier at the time was part of United Technologies. So a bunch of names you know, Sikorsky Helicopter, uh, Otis Elevator, besides Carrier Air Conditioning, Pratt & Whitney Jet Engines. It was a big business. And I stayed on board as CEO. I agreed to stay on for three years. And we had to go from being a, a, a venture-backed business to a Fortune 50 overnight. So there are still people who have whiplash go, ha, having gone through that change. But it all worked out. And eventually, I decided to move to a consulting role because what I really wanted to do was write. <clears throat> Years ago, in between companies, I had authored a book about King Philip's War, which some of you may know was the war fought between the English and the Native Americans here in New England. So along with my MBA, as Joshua said, I have uh, a degree in history and really a love for the subject. And I thought that once I was out of sort of this quarter to quarter, make your numbers every quarter that I'd done for 30 years, that I could combine that experience with my love of history. And that's really the genesis for the book. As I was beginning my own research process, the folks at Carrier discovered that I had done some writing and they knew I wanted to write, so they asked me to do their corporate history and that turned into Weathermakers to the World. And the research for that book had me in the Syracuse archives over six months for a couple of days a weekend, but it was all of Willis Carrier's engineering notebooks, all of his correspondence, all of the really interesting projects they did over the first 50 years. Carrier was just a kid from Buffalo, New York. He graduated from Cornell with a degree in engineering in 1901, and then along with six partners, uh, launched a startup that sold this invisible product that nobody really understood. It's sort of what we're used to now, but <clears throat> they started first in factories, anything that was affected by moisture. So it was uh, textiles, ammunition plants for World War I, and then into department stores, and then into movie theaters. And really their big breakthrough was they cooled the Rivoli Theater on Broadway. In, uh, it was launched on Memorial Day, 1925. It was an immediate hit, and air conditioning sort of made its way through the, through the theater business. So, Americans who were too poor to buy air conditioners for their homes could go to the movies every Saturday and experience what it was like on a hot, sticky day to actually feel comfortable. So it's a great story. Um, and so that became or would become one of the chapters for my book. And that worked out pretty well. So UTC asked me to partner with their VP of sustainability and together we wrote Food Foolish, 
which was based on some research being done by the United Nations, uh, which hooked together food waste, climate change, and hunger. And um, that book and the research I did would create a whole theme in Innovation on Tap. So in one sense, I had some delays, but as hopefully you're learning here, every problem comes with a built-in opportunity. I ended up with a couple of new chapters that I hadn't expected from these delays. Okay, let's circle back for a second, and I want to tell you a story that is um, completely untrue, but it's a good story. A scientist publishes a paper that contains extraordinary findings about rats. In fact, the findings are so remarkable that a group of his colleagues decide they better visit him in the lab. And when they get there, he's standing next to his bench covered with this beautiful, immaculate bound notebooks, and he says, here is my research. Okay. Then he points to a little tiny cage in the corner and he says, and there's my rat. Okay. This is a story about how we acquire knowledge, right? The logic of acquiring knowledge. Let me give you a real life example. This biography of Steve Jobs was given to many CEOs in a holiday, December 2011. And then much to the horror of their management teams, in January, these CEOs started to show up in the office and try to act and talk just like Steve Jobs. This woman, who's back in the news at the moment, by the way, Elizabeth Holmes, was the CEO of Theranos. John Kerryo says in Bad Blood that her management team even knew what chapter she was on by how she was behaving that morning. In other words, Steve Jobs was her rat, right? She had identified one entrepreneur and then drew all of her lessons about how to be successful from that particular person. There's nothing wrong with having role models and aspirational role models. But you can see there's probably a flaw in that logic, right? Of making one person or one rat the root of all your knowledge. Can anyone tell me what the fundamental attribution error is? If you took sociology, maybe they do it in a psychology course, maybe behavioral economics. Yeah. Um, you attribute something that doesn't <clears throat> belong to uh, be attributed to that as an error. It's close. That's close. Just using yeah. the words. Maybe assuming that um, <clears throat> an attribute from like a small sample is applies to the whole population. Also very close, very close. You know that we're, we're all built with all of these cognitive biases. They got all kinds of names, right? I, I wrote some of them down. There's the conjunction fallacy, the endowment effect, the false consensus, the worse than average effect. Well, the fundamental attribution error was introduced in 1977, and it's considered the bedrock fundamental cognitive bias that we all have. And if I were to say it, in my own language, when we analyze a situation, we give the individual too much credit and the context not enough, okay? Almost every time. This is important for you to internalize, okay? You come to a, you come to a red light this morning. There's no one, in the, no one in the intersection. It's a long red light, you look down at your phone. You're not supposed to, but you look down at your phone, right? You're just waiting. You look up, your light screen, and someone races through. Your immediate reaction is that person is an idiot. Just ran that red light. Right? That would be my reaction. What's he doing? Well, you find out later that, oh, he was, had a sick child in his car. He looked at you and he saw that you were looking down at your phone. He knew he could make it. He got to the hospital in time. The kid's okay. The guy's a genius, right? Once you have the context, it changes how you think about a situation. You and I took a, take a test. We both fail, right? You're just not very smart. Me, this is the one time when you don't have the, the, the uh, fundamental attribution error when you're talking about yourself. I didn't give, get enough sleep. I missed the review. My number two pencil broke. I have all kinds of contextual reasons why I didn't make it. You, I, I attribute a fun, the fundamental attribution bias. You're just not that smart, right? Let me give you some real life examples. I think, think someday we will tell very different stories about Elon Musk at Tesla, at SpaceX, and at Twitter. Same guy. Same strengths and weaknesses, same management style. Right now, it's feeling like there's going to be some pretty different outcomes from those com com uh, companies. Tom Brady, greatest quarterback ever, right? Focused, disciplined, great leadership. <clears throat> but if he'd been drafted by the, I don't know, the New York Jets or the Cleveland Browns or one of the dysfunctional franchises in the National Football League, would he be the greatest quarterback ever? If he hadn't met Bill Belichick, better yet, if Bill Belichick hadn't met Tom Brady, would he be the greatest coach? It's, there's so much context when you think about these individuals, right? Here's a good one, Henry Ford, okay? Henry Ford, one of his senior managers, goes on vacation in the Midwest, turn of the century, 
goes to Cincinnati, pork capital of the world, and he sees this moving disassembly line, which is, I don't know if you've seen them, they put carcasses on chains, you cut off the piece you want, you slide it down, the next butcher cuts off the piece, slides it down. He brings the idea back to Detroit, to Henry Ford, and the next thing you know, you have a moving assembly line, it changes the world. I don't know whether Ford would have thought of that himself or not, but I know that contextually you need to know how these things are put together to understand someone's success or failure. So Musk, Brady, Ford, all incredible talents, take nothing away from them, but if you don't understand the context, you really don't understand their success or failure. This is my last example, but for the first 20 years Casey Stengel managed, it was a disaster. Then he got hired by the New York Yankees and he had five World Series in five years. Then he got hired by the New York Mets and he went 40 and 120. Okay? And the great Yogi Berra said, I knew Casey Stengel before he was a genius, while he was a genius, and after he was a genius. Okay? I want you to think about that quote because you may be saying that about Elon Musk five years from now, right? It's all contextual. Okay, so if context is critical to entrepreneurial success, let's talk about what it is. And this stuff is summarized in the introduction of the book, okay? Just, just an aside for a second. When you read a nonfiction book for the rest of your life, I don't want you to start with page one and start reading, okay? I want you to read the introduction first. If it's a good introduction, it will summarize the book for you. It's like the magazine article. You can read the epilogue, you can read the acknowledgements and see who they talk to, maybe the bio of the author. But don't start reading the book until there are going to be 1.7 million books in English published this year. Okay? You don't have time to start a book that's no good. So start with the introduction, read the introduction. This part that I'm going to talk to you about now is, in the, is the introduction to the book. After you read that, the book may still be something you want to read, but at least you go in with a lot of knowledge about it. Okay? So my conclusions are coming up are based on looking at a couple of hundred rats. Okay? And three things will drive your success. One is going to be your own skill. Smarter people generally make better decisions and they do better. The second, though, is your business model. The quality of your business model um, will, if it's really strong, will make up for all of your weaknesses and all of your team's weaknesses. I've seen it ag again and again. A powerful business model will make untalented entrepreneurs successful, will make accidental entrepreneurs successful, will make reluctant entre entrepreneurs successful, despite themselves. Read about the start of Google sometime, right? One of the be best stories about two ambivalent, reluctant entrepreneurs. Page and Bryn originally wanted to be academics, not business owners. After developing their initial search engine, they tried to sell the company. The two founders of what is arguably one of the most valuable businesses ever built were reluctant entrepreneurs. They get dragged into business because the people around them saw that ad-supported uh, search was a killer business model. Right? Now they became geniuses. Right? Throughout your life, you're going to meet some really smart people who are only marginally successful in business. And you're going to meet some people who you wouldn't trust to, to, to organize your lunch, who, who, are, who are rich and who are very successful. A lot of it comes down to the quality of their business model. By the way, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, a tremendous number of articles written about entrepreneurial grit and persistence. To me, grit is not an entrepreneurial skill as much as it is a life skill, right? You want your doctor not to give up on your diagnosis or your lawyer not to give up on your case. You want your kids, when you have them, to do their homework every night. I mean, perseverance and grit are a good thing. It's a skill, though. It's not a sacrament. It's not a religion. If you want to have a few terrible years, pick a lousy business model and apply all your grit to it, right? Persevere through that. It'll be the worst few years of your life, right? One of the skills you need to develop as entrepreneurs is knowing when to walk away from a weak or a broken business model, right? <clears throat> Save your grit for another day. Okay, the third leg of the entrepreneurial uh, context is community, right? And now you've got the complete picture of the model laid out in the introduction. There's talent, there's business model, and there's community. And I believe that community is, is your superpower. Your willingness to bump into people and to make friends and colleagues and turn them into folks who want you to be successful can, can change your life. Okay? We all have enormous holes in our game. We know that. I'm a historian with an MBA. If I want to start a tech company, I'm going to need an engineer. I know that. I know I'm, I'm not a very good sales guy. I know I'm going to need a quality salespeople. So I will intentionally use my network in order to find those people. 
But real community, not just networking, real community can have other kinds of um, life-changing kinds of advantages. When I was uh, a sophomore in college, this would have been 1976, and that sounds even old, a long time ago to me, uh, I worked with a guy who um, I became friends with, not, not drinking buddies, but friendly with, and we'd, we'd sort of, uh, you know, trade calls a couple of times a year. Graduating now seven years later from business school in 1983, I'm looking for a job, and I get a call from him out of the blue, and he says, there's a guy named Steve Dodge, you have to meet him, right? just out of the goodness of his heart. This, my friend Richard did this. I met this guy, it changed my life, right? We started a company together. He's responsible for whatever success I've had, a good part of it. So that's what I mean by community. It's not just network. It's building sort of a bunch of friends out there and people that, it, if you look around in this room and you work with these people over the course of the next few months and you don't make an effort to meet everyone, you're, you're losing something, right? You're just losing something that, you, that two years from now could change your life, seven years from now could change your life. A few minutes ago, I invited you to link in with me. And why would you link in with a guy who's basically retired and older than most of your parents? The answer is, I have no idea why you would do that, except I would encourage you to do it because a year from now or two years from now, there may be someone you wanna meet who you look on my network and I know them. I would do everything I could to get you in front of that person and maybe it will change your life. So th think of it this way. Um, of all the things that will make you successful, finding and cultivating a powerful business model, I think is the most, has the highest impact. But it's also one of the hardest. At the same time, cultivating community can have almost as great an impact. And to me, it's the easiest, right? In fact, it might be the thing that fixes your broken business model by finding the right person. So if you could spend a few minutes every day just doing something that's sort of fun, meeting people and making sure you, you know everyone in your cohort, then, and it could change your life someday, why not do it? So that's in the book's introduction. It's talent, business model, community. Now the preface. So I'm in the middle of reading about all these rats getting ready to write this book. And I'm collecting these interesting stories and I'm trying to figure out how to make sense of it all. So it's a compelling story for other people. After we sold Sensitech, I was invited to become a CEO partner at Ascent Ventures in Boston. And in that role, role they dropped me into a company called Hubcast, an, a print in the cloud startup. And I was helping the CEO trying to raise money. So the two of us had been invited to this after work event with one of the venture firms that was courting us and we were courting them. And the program that evening was gonna feature three of their CEOs presenting their companies. If you've ever been to one of these or if you've been part of one of these, you know that the presenting CEOs are pretty much on the spot, right? They are speaking to their investors, to their potential investors, to their colleagues. So they have to put on an awesome show, right? It's hockey stick growth, it's a great management team, it's recurring revenue, it's high margins, right? But afterwards, we're standing around at the sort of makeshift bar in the lobby of this venture firm and sipping beverages, and that's when the truth came out, right? One CEO would be out of money in a couple of months if they didn't get this round raised, right? The next one was, had a competitor that hadn't existed three months before, right? N nothing unusual, but hard ups are star uh, yeah, startups are hard, and, and we were starting to hear the real stories. And as we were standing there, I, I, I got to thinking, wouldn't it be interesting if Willis Carrier could be there with us, right? He'd launched a company during World War I. He'd scaled it during an influenza pandemic. He'd grown it during the Great Depression, and then he ran into another world war. Pretty interesting set of stories. I'd also been reading about Eli Whitney. We'll talk about him in a few minutes. He had a cotton gin startup, right? If Whitney had been with us, he would have said, oh, I got smallpox, I got malaria, I got in a shipwreck on my way to my first job, uh, my New Haven factory burned to the ground, and my partner uh, died of some hideous tropical disease. And I spent a decade in court litigating my patent, uh, my cotton gin patent. By the way, this is a, a little panel from a, a startup called Booksplainer. And they contacted me right after the book came out and they said for 150 bucks, we can do a 30 second uh, video for you. So I took them up on it and it worked out pretty well. On the way home that evening, so I had my epif epiphany then, right? I would build a bar room and put all these entrepreneurs in it, living and dead get them all together so they could share their stories, could maybe poke fun at each other and have a little bit of fun. But I could also create a flow to the book, right? And make sure that the, that the flow worked. So I'm ready to go. 
and I'm going to write about entrepreneurs for two or three hundred pages. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if I started by defining what I thought an entrepreneur was? Because it's used in a lot of different ways. And for that, since I had a bar room, I needed a bouncer. So I turned to Joseph Schumpeter. He's the famous Austrian economist. If you uh, don't know him, you probably know his term creative destruction. Ring a bell with everyone? Anyone? Okay. Schumpeter was brilliant. He taught at Harvard from 1932 until his death in 1950. And his famous quote was, he had a lot of famous quotes, but early in life, I had three ambitions. I wanted to be the greatest economist in the world, the greatest horseman in Austria, and the best lover in Vienna. And then he would, then he would pause and look you in the eye and he'd go, well, I never became the greatest horseman in Austria. And I thought, <laughs> That's my guy, right? An economist with a sense of humor. That's my bouncer. So when I put my new bouncer at the door to check IDs, this is what he said, okay? An entrepreneur does two things and only ever needs to do two things. He or she brings a novel combination to market. In other words, they combine two things that have never been combined before. Maybe it's a camera and a phone. But it doesn't have to be technology and it doesn't have to be new. It could be chocolate and peanut butter for a new candy bar. It could be wheels on luggage, which I think is one of the great, great innovations of all time, right? Wheels are a million years old and luggage is thousands of years old. So, And then, Schumpeter said, this novel combination has to disrupt an economic flow. So he, what he was concerned about was that capitalism would grind to a halt. Henry Ford creates a Model T, he sells the Model T, and after five or ten years, everyone who wants a Model T has a Model T. Right? And all he's getting now for new sales is broken Model Ts and worn out Model Ts. Right? There has to be some novel combination, blue and the Model T. A blue Model T, that, that disrupts the, the economic cycle. Right? You put sides on it so a family riding doesn't get wet. That's a novel combination. That's what Schumpeter was after. And what he expected was there would be these economic agents called entrepreneurs out there who are creating this disruptive, this creative destruction. A better way to say it might be an entrepreneur launches an innovation that creates new customers where none ever existed before. Just as an aside, by the way, Peter Drucker, a name you should know or you will know as you, as you sort of become a student of the industry, was asked to name the greatest innovation of the 19th century. Now, if you know a little bit about 19th century innovation, it would be the steam engine, the electrical grid, the tele telegraph, the telephone. He said, no, it was the professional R&D lab. Okay, that was the greatest innovation of the 19th century. He had identified a novel combination of people, of process, and of knowledge. And those kinds of innovations, like the university, and the hospital, and the labor union, and the New Deal, tend to be some of the most consequential innovations of all. Okay? So when, if you just think of innovation as technology, you might miss some of the really exciting stuff. Okay? Just a warning. By the way, that book is worth owning. That book is worth putting in your collection. It's a little dated, it was writ written in the 80s, but there's some really good ideas in it. Okay, so Schumpeter had a really clever way of making the distinction between launching any old business and launching a true entre entrepreneurial business. He said, add successively as many male coaches as you please, you will never get a railway thereby. Okay, he was Austrian, English was his second language, maybe not the most elegant way to say it. I might say it, launch as many new taxi companies as you want, you'll never create an Uber. Okay. That distinction is critical. Every day there are people who are launching barbershops and architecture firms and new McDonald's franchises. In our world, in our bar, they're sole proprietors, they're business owners, they may have taken on a lot of risk, they're admirable people, but they're not entrepreneurs because all they're doing is stealing customers from an existing flow. If you sell roadkill at McDonald's, right, that's a novel combination, right? If you have fine dining with wine after five o'clock, if you drop a McDonald's into North Korea where there is none, those are all novel combinations. But simply having the new franchise isn't, in our, in, in, in our bar room anyway, an entrepreneur, okay? So when, the guests, when guests show up at, at the door, Schumpeter doesn't care if they have grit or perseverance, right? He doesn't care if they're reluctant. He doesn't care if they stumbled into their business model. He doesn't care if they drove a Tesla to the bar. He doesn't care if they're a historian, thankfully, or, or, or an engineer, right? They could be accidental, they could be reluctant, they could be dumb, right? As long as they are bringing a novel combination to market that disrupts an economic flow, they're in. And those, that's the definition that I use to let people into my bar room, okay? So Innovation on Tap features 24 entrepreneurs. 
and they're designed to sort of help you fill up the tank, right? They're all different. All the stories are different. There are 10 entrepreneurs that are living, right? If you want to practice your community building skills and you read the book, pick up the phone and call one of them. I can tell you that all 10 of them know how to build community because I cold called them and said, want to be in a book? And they said, yes, right? So they understand what it is to be open to new possibilities, okay? <clears throat> Jason Jacobs is one. He founded RunKeeper. Jason took on too much venture capital. He had the venture firms redefine his business and he almost lost it. But he had a tremendous save. It's a really interesting story. He's a really good guy right in Boston. Brenna Berman, former CTO of the city of Chicago, brilliant, smart city stuff, measuring what goes on in an urban environment to improve the quality of life. Jean Brownhill, one of the few black female entrepreneurs to raise more than a million dollars in venture capital. And she has raised way more than a million dollars. She's also dyslexic. She tells a story very interesting. It's a very interesting. You're not supposed to like one of your children more than your other children. I like this story as much as I like any in the book. She's a really interesting, fascinating uh, woman. And then Brett Grinna, some of you may know him, CEO of Evertrue, right in Boston, maybe the best builder of community in the book. When you read his chapter, you'll see what I mean. Joshua, he's from Idaho or someplace out there, and he's a uh, <laughs> Kate Sincotta is, is in the book, she, MIT grad, she was an aerospace engineer, but she purposely chose a low-tech solution to bring clean water to the folks in Ghana. And her business model relies on local female entrepreneurs, finding them and making sure that they can run the business. And Viraj Puri, uh, Gotham Greens, maybe the best at building a sustainable business model. He's a little bit different from Jason. He pushed off the venture money for a long time until he was sure he could scale his business. And then he took a pile of it on. It's been very successful. And then there are these four, and there are some other, um, there are some other living, breathing entrepreneurs in the book, but there are these 14 historical characters as well. You'll have, um, you'll have a harder time getting them on the phone, but you can try if you want. We're gonna chat about some of these folks in our chats uh, coming up in a minute. Uh, but I wanted to mention a few. John Merrick founded one of the largest black enterprises in America. He offered insurance to a disenfranchised segment that had never been allowed to buy insurance before. And I think he saved countless families uh, uh, in the pandemic after World War I. And Mary Elizabeth Evans launched a candy and hospitality com company that was so successful that some of her competitors, her male competitors, of course, thought she was um, fronting a hidden trust couldn't really be her talent that got her there, right? Really good story. Uh, Oliver Ames founded a shovel works in Easton Mass, not far from here, that one, would one day produce two thirds of all the shovels in the world. If you want an interesting tour sometime, if you're near Stonehill College, call up and see if you can visit the Ames Shovel Collection. By the way, just the first shovels were built with straight handles. The Ames bend put a little bend in the handle, right? A great innovation, it probably saved a thousand backs, right? that little bend in the shovel. And James Fortin became one of Philadelphia's and one of the country's largest and most technologically advanced sail makers. And then he used his profits to fight for civil rights. Stephen Mather was founder of the National Park Service, one of the great innovations, I think, in American history. But before he did that, he created the 20 Mule Train ad campaign that turned borax Borax is the most boring white substance. There's nothing romantic about it at all. Mining it in Death Valley is just hard, dirty work. And he turned it into sort of this romantic branded product. And he did it with almost no money. Mather was a manic depressive. And when he was depressed, he, was, he could be suicidal. And he discovered long before the science existed that being out in, the, in nature helped to make him feel better. And that's part of the genesis of the National Park Service. Good story. And Alfred Sloan, right? CEO of General Motors. In many ways, he invented modern management. The model year, market segmentation. Sloan could have bankrupted Henry Ford if he wanted to. And by the way, he was an introvert. He was known as Silent Sloan. And it's just another good reminder that there is no one type of successful entrepreneur, right? You are who you are. Build your community around your weaknesses and make sure that you have a, a team that hits on all cylinders. And by the way, I argue in this chapter that Sloan was America's most successful entrepreneur ever. I also wanted to mention this guy, King Gillette, right? King Camp Gillette was his full name. He was a Wisconsin native. 
He was a traveling salesman for Crown Cork and Seal. It was a company that made disposable bottle caps. And in his spare time, he patented this thin steel disposable shaving blade with a handle to lock it down. He had this idea in 1895. And for the next five years, he spoke with everyone in his network, in his bottling network, and could not find a single person who either believed it would work or could build the machine to actually, to actually make the blades. Now, King's network is made up of bottlers, and one of them happens to be named Edward Stewart, right here in Boston. Stewart couldn't be helpful, but he approached his neighbor, Henry Sachs, who happened to be a Boston lamp manufacturer. Right? Sachs takes the idea to his friend, a guy named William Emery Nickerson. He's an MIT grad. I think he was a genius. Nickerson is interested. He meets Gillette, and one of the most successful partnerships of the 20th century is formed. By 1918, Gillette is making 22 miles of sharpened blade a day in their Boston facility. So I want you to just think about for a second what happened in this story, just to go back and, and reemphasize this idea of community. Let's say that the gray circle is Gillette's bottling network, and that's his friend, Edward Stewart. Gillette's network and your network and my network are made up of what, they, what theorists call strong links, right? They're your friends, they're your colleagues, they're the people in this room that you know well, they're the, your good customers, right? Your strong links are gonna be pivotal to your success. But the downside is to your network is you kinda of know all the same people. You kinda of trade all the same information. So Gillette tries for five years within this strong network and is unsuccessful. The purple is Henry Sachs' network of strong links. And this is all about lamp making and lamp marketing. And, and Nickerson happens to be in that network. The only way Nickerson gets to Gillette is right here. That's called a weak link, okay? The strong links are in the circle, the weak links connect, the, the, and for a long time, theorists didn't pay much attention to weak links. But it's obvious the role that they play in, this, in, in networking, right? Those two people, Gillette and Nickerson, are never going to get together unless someone has the courage to walk across the hall or across the street and meet with their neighbor or link in with someone they don't know, or when you sit down on an airplane, don't put your headphones on right away, talk to the people on both sides of you, right? Be open, someone calls you and says, I wanna have a coffee, could I talk to you, could I pick your brain? Take the call, take the meeting. That's all about community building. Those are the weak links, they're uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable, especially for people if you've been texting, I didn't have text when I grew up, so, but you've been in a couple of years of COVID. You're not so used to doing face-to-face, -face. those kinds, pick up the phone and call Brent Grinner. Oh, Eric said great things about you. Could I come down and have coffee? It doesn't always work, but those weak links are gonna be absolutely essential to your success. Strong and, strong and weak both. Okay, let's do a few chats and talk. The first chat is called, Can You Ask a Better Question? All right. We're gonna go back to our friend Eli Whitney to give you some background. He's born in 1765, not too far from here, uh, Westboro, Massachusetts. He goes to Yale University, and then he doesn't know what he wants to do. He, does, he knows he doesn't want to farm, so he takes a tutoring job at a plantation in South Carolina. He has never seen a cotton plant in his life at this point, right? And America, you may know, after the American Revolution was pretty poor, right? The whole economy had been disrupted. Our major trading partner wasn't trading with us anymore. And the South, in particular, was in desperate need of a cash crop. And cotton was one possibility because the textile industry in New England and, and in Great Britain had taken off. There'd been a couple of uh, innovations, the, the spinning mule and the water frame and things that I don't understand how they work, but they had really started to power the industry. But the problem was on the farm, and that was in the supply chain, they couldn't separate the green seeds from the cotton bowl very effectively. This is, um, this is in Arizona. I, I was told after I could have been shot, but I went on to this cotton plant and grabbed, <laughs> grabbed a bowl because I wanted to try to pull the green seeds out my, myself. So this is the choke point in the, the whole, the bottleneck in the whole value chain for getting a cotton plant turned into clothing that someone could wear, right? And it's a difference between making America rich and keeping America poor. The rule of thumb in, in, in Eli Whitney's time was one person could gin by hand one pound of clean cotton a day. That's it, one pound, okay? Southern mechanics, and mechanics is, is a term that was used in colonial America to anyone who was sort of good with machinery. Southern mechanics had worked on this problem for a century and they'd been unable to solve it. How do I separate green seeds from short staple cotton? A month after he gets to South Carolina, Whitney's got a machine that works. 
So how did he do it? Well, he's mechanically gifted, we think. But his other strength was that he had no clue how the value chain for cotton worked, right? Because the longer and more intact the staple is, the easier it was for mills to weave strong, smooth thread. So long staple varieties, even today, Sea Island or Egyptian or, or, or Pima cotton are the most valuable. But the advantage of American short staple cotton was that it was disease resistant, it was bug resistant, and anywhere you had a growing season of 200 days, you could grow it. And that was from Virginia to California in this country. My observation in the book, in that chapter, is that Whitney was so successful so quickly because he asked a different question. Instead of asking, how do I separate green seeds from short staple cotton? He said, how do I separate short staple cotton from green seeds? It sounds like nothing, but it, it dented the universe, okay? Um, Southern mechanics have been trying to carefully pull the seeds out of cotton to preserve the thread. Whitney didn't know that, so he created this sort of, I don't know if you've ever seen one, the spinning machine, it has, it has teeth, it grabs the cotton, and there's a little grate, and it's too narrow for the seed to, sit, uh, to fit through, and it yanks the staple through, and the seed falls to the bottom. It's, it's brilliant. If you've, it looks like a popcorn machine. It's like all this cotton's popping up like a popcorn machine. It destroyed the staple, but it did it so fast and so well Right? That it changed the, it, in fact, overnight, one person could go from one pound to 50 pounds a day. Right? In 1794, that's a productivity improvement. Right? And once you hooked it up to steam power and made bigger ones, you could really start to generate lots and lots of capital, lots and lots of money for farmers and for the industry. So along the value chain, they just got used to having different kinds of cotton. They readjusted for it, and short staple cotton became the sort of the de facto standard in the industry. Okay, now I'm going to need your help with this one. This article was published in the Harvard Business Review in 2017, and it begins like this. Imagine this. You are the owner of an office building, and your tenants are complaining about the elevator. It's old and it's slow, and they have to wait a lot. Several tenants are threatening to break their leases if you don't fix the problem. When asked, most people quickly identify some solutions. Replace the elevator would be the logical one, right? Install a stronger motor or maybe you can upgrade an algorithm that runs the lift. So the first framing of that problem is inevitably, how do I make the elevator run more quickly? And look, we are paid as managers to be proactive, to jump in, to get things done, to solve things. Right? But what the managers of the building did was this. They put mirrors up next to the elevator and the complaints went away. Okay. So remembering Eli Whitney, Tell me what just happened. Yeah. Uh, instead of making the elevator run more quickly, they made something to do while you're waiting for the elevator. Okay. Anyone else? They reframed. That's right. They reframed the question. The way I would the way I would say it was very close to you. How do I improve the elevator experience? Okay, this is sort of a, a Disney thing, right? Disney has incredibly long lines. Instead of trying to, I, I know they try to shorten the lines because they, but they also create these mazes where the lines come into these, right? These, you've, if you've been to Six Flags or, then they put a roof over it so you're not in the sun. Then they put some uh, videos up for the kids and they put some water out for the parents. They try to improve the line experience. They don't try to shorten the line, right? It's a very elegant way of solving a problem by reframing it. If we broke into small groups right, and tried to reframe it in other ways, I'm imagining we would come up with several ways to do it. One is, how do I shave peak demand? Right? Suppose I just, instead of opening the office at 6 o'clock, I open it at 5 o'clock. And instead of, instead of having lunch from 11 to 1, I do it from 10.30 to 2. All those people standing there waiting start to spread out. Maybe that's an even cheaper way than I, don't, I didn't have to buy any mirrors at that point. So um, there's a, this is not true either. Mark Twain didn't say his quote. Albert Einstein didn't say this quote either, but I'll give it to you because it's out there on the web. If I were given one hour to save the planet, I would spend 59 minutes defining the problem and one minute resolving it. Okay? I would take maybe half an hour, right? Maybe not a minute. But I want you, I want you to be sure that <clears throat> as you wake up tomorrow and think about your business, your business planning, 
that, you, that there might not be a better way to reframe a question, right, that you're trying to solve to make it more cheap, you know, cheaper or more efficient or more elegant in terms of its solution. It's something to add to your bag of tricks. Don't rush into every problem and try to solve it as fast as you can. Spend some time before that looking at different ways to reframe it. If you're like me, when history is visual and tactile, it's kind of kind of more fun. So if you get can get to the Slater Mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, they have a working cotton gin. You can see how it see how it actually runs. Kind of fun. <clears throat> and if you want to chat with Eli, he's buried uh, at Yale at the Grove Street Cemetery. That's where I did my interview. Uh, and, and he's near a bunch of other uh, really interesting entrepreneurs like Charles Goodyear, uh, the rubber guy. And you can see down there there's a gentleman who tried to carve his resume into his stone. I like that as well. But Okay, chat, chat number two. Is it ever okay for entrepreneurs to lie? Okay, we're going to go back to our friend who was a true serial entrepreneur. He's mired down with his cotton gin, but he has a new opportunity. So it's 1798 now, Napoleon's uh, causing problems on the continent, and it looks like America might go to war with France. George Washington has authorized the Springfield Armory, maybe some of you visited it, in 1794, and they're supposed to be making guns as fast as they can, right? But in the four years up to 1798, they make about a thousand muskets, right? Not bad, not bad. So the government panics and they authorize $800,000. And that $800,000 is going to be invested in Springfield. It's going to be invested in this new armory down in Virginia called Harper's Ferry. And they also open it up to any craftsman in, in America who wants to build muskets. And individual craftsmen say, I'll build 50, I'll get a contract for 100. I think the largest is 200, a contract for 200. Whitney's in big trouble, right? His cotton gin business, and you can, I won't give you all the ideas, but it's basically ground to a halt. People are building his cotton gin and not paying him for it. He's in court, he's in debt. So he decides, and he's mad, you can tell. He's angry at the, he's angry at the court system, he's angry at everybody. So he writes to Washington, D.C., and he says, <clears throat> I'll build 10,000 complete sets of muskets, bayonets, ramrods, everything. And he tells him he's going to do it with interchangeable parts. That is the holy grail of the early republic, right? If you could build anything with matching parts, but muskets they were particularly interested in because if two of them broke on the battlefield, you didn't have to pull them both back. You could actually swap parts and make a working musket. That was the idea. But this will this will migrate to farm equipment and typewriters and bicycles and eventually Henry Ford's assembly line, right? <clears throat> so um, three weeks later, the government has given Whitney a contract to deliver 4,000 the first year and 6,000 the second year, right? $134,000, and they give him a $5,000 advance. The first advance ever given to an American citizen by the government, and the only advance given as part of these contracts. And it saves his company, basically. Whitney has never made a musket in his life. He doesn't have a factory to make them, and now he's committed to make 10 times the number that the Springfield Armory, in two years, that the Springfield Armory made in four. And look, it's among the most complicated products to make in the early Republic. The, you know, a, a lock, stock, and barrel. So the stock needs to really be hand carved, uh, unless you have a lathe that does it. But that lathe doesn't exist, we find out later, right? The barrel needs to be this hardened steel and there's this percussive shock every time it fires. And the most complicated part is called the lock. Whitney has lots of critics. He has lots of skeptics. He may have invented the cotton gin. He may be a genius, but he doesn't know anything about making muskets, and he proves them right. right? He delivers 500 muskets. Not bad in the first year, but he's out of money again. So here's what he does. <clears throat> he heads to Washington in January 1801, and this is a make-or-break trip for him. He's going to lose his company, his reputation, his career if he's not successful. And he hosts one of the most dramatic product demonstrations in American history. We think it took place at the White House. We know John Adams was there. We know President-elect Thomas Jefferson was there, Secretary of War, probably three or four others. Whitney takes a whole bunch of lock parts and he lays them out on the table in front of, in front of uh, his audience. And he says, you can mix and match these in any combination you want and I will make a working lock for you. And they do, and he does, and, and they're flabbergasted. Jefferson especially is. He, he, he says, can I write a letter to James Monroe, who's the governor of Virginia, and recommend you to make guns? Now remember, he hasn't, he hasn't uh, met any of the terms of his contract, but this idea of interchangeable parts is so powerful 
that he basically leaves Washington with another $10,000 advance, his reputation is intact, his career is intact, and eventually he learns to make muskets, and he'll die a rich man. But after this, he will always be the father of interchangeable parts. Skip ahead now to 1959. There's an MIT historian who goes to a Connecticut museum where there's a bunch of locks that are 1801, so they're dated exactly the same time as Whitney's building them, and he says, can I take them out and examine them? He takes them out and he finds out that they're hand filed. A lot of them have numbers on them because they have to fit perfectly with the other one. And he says, there's nothing interchangeable about what Eli Whitney was doing. He basically lied. He pulled, hand pulled the right, the correct numbers and, and made this product demo work. But he was not the father of interchangeable parts, right? In fact, Whitney, as I said, would go on and make muskets for years and he'd sort of get better at it. Um, and when he dies and for the next, until 1959, he's the father of interchangeable parts. It's all based on a lie. <clears throat> so my question to you is, is it ever okay for an entrepreneur to lie? You're gonna face this question every day of your entrepreneurial life. Every time you do a forecast, every time you meet with an investor, Every time you know you're only one of 200 business plans that they're going to look at this year, right? I don't think it's okay to lie because if you don't really believe in it, <clears throat> that's reality. Anyways, you're, you're selling what you might think the future may be, but it's not really a, a lie. So if you're saying you can do something, then you must believe it. Otherwise, it's fraud. So that's my standpoint. Interesting. Yeah, probably depends on the ends and the means that you're justifying. Say, so, can you say more? Um, <laughs> uh, just like, depends on the impact you're making, regardless of what you're doing. I guess. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. I mean, yeah. Similarly, it's. I don't know. I feel like consequence is like, the the heaviest thing that I weigh. Um, especially like if if there's a high chance that the lie is going to turn out very negatively for your investors for you for everyone then obviously not but if it's a super extreme you know in the other direction where it's a tiny lie or you know and you know that like with this momentum and it's like highly probable i don't know i mean morally you want to say no but i feel like there are shades of morality if eli whitney thought that he was going to have interchangeable parts perfected in the next month, would it have been okay to do what he did? They weren't perfected yet, but they would be. If he thought that was going to be the case, I'd say yeah, because he had to do what he had to do to restore his reputation, to get funding, to continue his projects. So if he didn't lie, then he wouldn't have the opportunity to succeed in the first place. Okay. So a month is okay. How about a year? If, if he was confident, yeah. I think that's okay. All right. So we get kind of a, an interesting argument down here, right? If you're confident enough about the future, you can tell a... Well, look, you know how Eskimos have 50 words for snow? Maybe entrepreneurs need 50 words for lying, that kind of thing. It's sort of like, it's not really a lie, but anyone want to weigh in on that? Yeah, Josh. I think... History has brought us a lot of horrible examples of the outcome from that, right? We can think of Theranos, and you had right. homes up earlier with a lie that keeps compounding. We had a real estate agency that just shut down after they were pulling commissions they owed to someone else to keep afloat because everything's going to be better in a month, and I can cover it until then, and that compounds. Yep. Uh, examples of Enron or FTX mm -hmm. or, yeah, we, we could go on and on. Yep. I think. Context is everything, as you said before, and there are lies that, if they roll down that hill, can't be stopped right. and have deep consequence. Right. Good. So you you answered the question. What I heard when I first asked that question was someone said no. That is the way to start the answer, right? If you're in front of a, someone, a venture firm, or your board of directors, and someone says, oh, Eric, is it ever okay to tell a lie? No, <laughs> right, period. And then pause, it's like, you know, trumpeter, I'm gonna pause. 
But let me explain to you that. If, if you want me at 15 and I'm at 10, right, and I have three assumptions, I can go back to my assumptions and I can say to you, you know, I think this is going to be four, but if this happens and this happens, it's going to be six. I'm going to be completely transparent with you. I'm going to put it in the notes. I'm going to call it out, but I'm going to now project six instead of four. That gets me a lot closer to your number when I do my, when I do my multiplication. So being aggressive but transparent is, is, is okay. It's, that's my, my take on it. That's not a lie, right? There's a really interesting, some of you may have read about this, right? In 2007, Steve Jobs launched the iPhone. The product demo was faked, right? The iPhone didn't do what he, what he showed on the stage that day. Look at the kind of press he gets. This is a genius way to fake your way through it. Misled a room and changed the world, right? There's like, yeah, that was great. He lied to us all and it worked out well. If it works out well, you're going to probably get away with it. If it doesn't, like Enron and some other, and, and Theranos, you're going to be in a world of trouble. So my sense is you don't lie, but you can be aggressive if you're transparent, right? And when, and this, I'm thinking about raising money at this point. When you have a board of directors, my general feeling is as soon as you get bad news, you tell them. The good news you can hang on to for when you need it. So if you can hang on to it for a week and there's some bad news, right? But the bad news comes out right away. So, so the answer to the question is never, no, I don't lie, but I will be aggressive. I have a friend who calls it the, you know, the, what does he call it, the purple defense? If I, can, if I can justify a number and not turn purple, I'm okay with that number, right? So I, he'll push it as far as he can, but he's transparent with it. Well, like here's, here's what the iPhone does, Yep. but we don't have an iPhone yet. Right. It's, it's in construction, right. and it ended up doing what he said. Right. He was so sure, someone said this, um, he was so sure that um, it was going to work, that he just, he figured, I'm sure in Steve Jobs' mind it wasn't a lie. It was just forecasting the future a little bit, okay. right? He had a way of doing that, but yeah. So just to clarify, you consider this aggressively being truthful? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to do what Steve Jobs did. I probably would have postponed the product demo until the thing worked the way I was gonna promise it worked. But that's, that's why he's him and I'm me, right? I mean, <laughs> it's a hard call, but they're all hard calls, okay? Always err on the side of being truthful, always err on the side of being transparent, okay? Good, we good? Right, I don't want to tell. I want you to, don't want you to go away thinking anything else. Yeah. <laughs> it's a hard question, though. It's a hard. It's and there is a very good article if you want to grab it. I think it's online. Dan Eisenberg uh, wrote it. Should entrepreneurs lie? Read the open. It says an experienced VC fund manager I have known for years told me recently that if a person does not know how to seriously twist the truth from time to time, he or she cannot be an entrepreneur. It's worth sort of reading together and talking through. I think Dan would say no. It's not okay to lie. He was my professor, one of my professors in business school. So, okay. All right. Know what business you're in. Two more and we'll do them quickly. Elizabeth Arden was a Canadian immigrant. Her real name was Florence Nightingale Graham. She moved to New York City in 1908 and she built a billion dollar empire that redefined beauty in America. Her empire consisted of these day spas that had these trademark red doors. And then from that, she had a line of cosmetics and beauty products. She had two market segments, and this is, I apologize for this, is vintage 1915 marketing, but she wanted to appeal to middle-aged women who wanted to recapture their youth and plain-looking women who hoped to find beauty in a bottle. That was her target segmentation. She reminds me very much of Steve Jobs. She was demanding, she was mercurial, she was really up and down with her uh, employees. She said, I only want people around me who can do the impossible. And she launched a steady stream of innovative products. One of her most famous was called the Vienna Youth Mask. Okay? It was paper mache with tin foil and it had electricity flowing through it. And it was supposed to remove wrinkles and make, make you look younger. It cost in today's equivalent dollars $3,600 for 30 treatments. That's like a 100, 510 per treatment. And its greatest success, its greatest revenue was during the Great Depression when nobody had any money. Right? Doctors examined it, didn't work. Scientists agreed, didn't work unanimously, right? But customers loved it. And Elizabeth Arden made a gazillion dollars on a product that did not work. So my question to you is, what's going on? How do you explain this phenomenon? Yeah. 
I mean, upon initial inspection, it looks a whole lot like she was saying snake oil. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. Maybe the experience itself was different. Maybe it wasn't about the product. Maybe she was training her people to like be a certain way and like make it a whole entertainment type of thing. And Do you all hear that? that? Y'all hear that? If you were, let's say you were upper middle class, because that's probably who she would be appealing to, and you had three kids and it's the middle of the depression and you don't have much money for anything, and you get three hours to be pampered, right? They could put almost anything on your face, right? <laughs> At that point, because you escape from, yeah, you escape from the world for a little while, right? So what business was she in? If she wasn't in the Vienna mask business, what business was she in? Yeah. The, like, entertainment or experience industry. Yeah, yeah, it's something, right, something like that. It was, yeah, yeah. I was going to say hospitality, kind of. Yep. To get me away from my kids and off this, you know, give me three hours to myself when I don't have anyone who's after me. That's a pretty good business to be in, right? And you know today, I mean, I just went through, I, I ex subscribed to this thing called Exploding Topics. One of them that came up, number one topic one week was red light therapy. I'd never heard of it before. It's supposed to treat all kinds of skin conditions from wrinkles to psoriasis to scars. You read the last sentence. Despite decades of research, the clinical benefits of red light therapy remain up in the air. In other words, it doesn't work. I didn't want to say that. And if you saw Doonesbury on Sunday, he took a, took a stab at Prevagen. Anybody know what Prevagen is? I, I, I forgot. Oh, no, that's a little Prevagen joke. It's, it's supposed to boost the memory of old people, right? And it doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. So we buy Vienna youth masks all the time. They're still highly profitable, but you got to know what people are buying, right? You got to know what business you're in. Years ago, you can find this online. Bain published the Elements of Value Pyramid. It's easy to find. Um, it's like Maslow's hierarchy on speed, and it will help you think about the benefits a product is delivering, product or service is delivering. But the real lesson is this, know what business you're in. You may think you're in a business, right? And customers start behaving in an odd way. Go talk to them. Find out what it is they're buying and what the value is that you're offering, because that's the way you're able to build on your business model and tweak it and make it stronger, okay? Know what business you're in. Okay, last chat. Do you want to be rich or do you want to be king or queen, okay? The final essay in the book is about Hamilton, right? It talks about innovation, all these sh sh uh, Schumpeterian sort of novel combinations. And I did it in a way that non-technical people would understand right away. So Thomas Jefferson, born in 1743, rap is circa 1980s. You put them together and something magical occurs, right? This brand new audience appears that never cared about theater, maybe never cared about American history, and suddenly they're flocking to Broadway, right? And I list a bunch more of those kinds of innovations in the chapter. The reviews for Hamilton are stunning. The New York Times says, yes, it really is that good. That's the opening sentence to a review. That's a good review, right? The payback to investors is also stunning. They put up about $12.5 million, kind of feels like a, a, venture, a venture startup. They will gross more than a billion in less than a decade. Okay. <clears throat> what I want you to think about is this, though. After opening night, after you get the flowers, after you get all the good reviews, after you get praise for how innovative you are, right? The cast of Hamilton has to get up the next day and do it again. Oh, President and Mrs. Obama are going to be here. They've got to be the best show ever. The next night, Stephen Sondheim's going to be here. Got to be the best show ever. Night after that, three Bronx high schools are coming. We don't want to let the kids down. Got to be the best show ever. Every night, it's got to be the best show, best show ever, right? It's the part of the entrepreneurial conversation that we sometimes forget because we're so focused on innovation. You forget that afterwards you got to run it and you got to do it over and over and over again when you find the magic formula, right? You want to have the same experience for everyone. Think of it in terms of uh, the Egg McMuffin, right? It was a true innovation in 1972, okay? It started the whole breakfast. We learned that we could eat in the car. We could eat on the run. I'm, I'm not so old that we didn't have fast food restaurants, but they were all dark until 11 o'clock in the morning when I was little because they had nothing to sell until the Egg McMuffin came along. But McDonald's success after that is getting 
unskilled workers in every country to make millions and millions and millions of Egg McMuffins the same way every single time, right? The last thing you want at seven o'clock in the morning is some young person innovating your breakfast, right? You want them doing it the way, the way they were taught. That is an entirely different skill than innovation. And it gets a lot of entrepreneurs in trouble who don't recognize that the shift is coming in their business. Kurt Vonnegut said, a flaw in the human character is that everyone wants to build and nobody wants to do maintenance. Peter Drucker had a better way of saying it. He said, think of entrepreneurship and management or operations as the string and the bow hand of a violin. They do very different things, but you don't have one or the other, you don't get any music out of, out of the violin, right? So in order to be successful through a launch, scale up and rapid growth, your skill set is going to need to change or you're gonna to have to bring on people with different skill sets, right? The way that sometimes said is leading 10 people 10 yards requires a certain skill. Leading 100 people one yard requires a certain skill. It's both 100 square yards. It's just a completely different way of thinking about how you lead. There's a famous article by Noah Wasserman. This is in the February. Again, all these I think are easily available online. The figures are pretty stark. He says 50% of founders are no longer CEO by year three. And most of them don't leave by choice. What happens though, is that someone who might never be able to write Hamilton, might never be able to envision an Egg McMuffin, can be a brilliant at making a million Egg McMuffins over and over again the same way, right? Just a different person. In other words, the second person, if the first person decides, the founder decides, that they're not good at the scale up stuff, they can continue to do it and be king, and maybe leave a lot of money on the table, or they can step aside and let someone do it who's good at it and be rich and have enough money for their second startup. It's a choice you get to make. And it's a choice you can be thinking about, right, as you go along because the question is, why am I building this business? Why am I an entrepreneur? Why do I care? If I care about getting rich, you go one way. If I care about being, and some of you, frankly, are gonna have the skill set to do both, right? You're gonna be able to do both. So it's not gonna be a problem for you, but it's gonna be a choice for, for many of you that you have to make. Um, there's no right answer to it. But if you wanna spend just a second, because I've just got a couple more slides left, why are you here? What are you trying to accomplish with this program? Right? You can answer out loud now, or you can think about it tonight, but it's good to know the answer to that question, okay? Because this will, this, if, you're, if you have a good business model, you built a nice community, got a little bit of talent, you're gonna have some success. And at some point this decision's gonna come up. Okay, all right. Here's a recap. One good way to get rich is to strike oil. You got that? Right, everybody knows that, okay. Become a student of the industry. Never stop filling your tank, right? Watch for rhymes, study lots of rats, not just one. Beware the fundamental attribution error. Think context, 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 okay? When you analyze a business problem, start from the outside in, context, down to the individual, not inside out. Grit is a skill, it is not a religion, right? Use it wisely. Reserve it for those times when, you, when it really is gonna pay off for you. Good book to own, good book to have on your shelf and to read. And then the last few things we did, can you ask a better question? Can you reframe the question? Should you ever lie? No, right? But, right? do you know what business you're in? And do you wanna be rich or do you wanna be king or queen? And then this is my, the closest I can come to you with, for, with a listicle is the three points that are in the introduction. I summarize the first one by saying, don't fall for the dominant narrative. In every generation, in mine it was, uh, let me think if I can remember, Lee Iacocca, Jack Welch, you wanted to be like them because they were so successful, right? And now it's Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos and then it was Bill Gates and it was Steve Jobs. You don't have to be those people. You be yourself. S Silent Sloan was himself was maybe the greatest entrepreneur in, Ameri in American history. Invest in yourself, get smart, use your community to build around your weaknesses, okay? Number two, success comes from a profitable, scalable business model. If there's one thing you can be good at, it's analyzing, it's cultivating, it's growing, it's tweaking, it's pivoting your business model, right? And last, community is an entrepreneur's superpower, right? Invest in your community and not just the strong links, make sure you Pay attention to the weak links because they can really pay off. So that's innovation on tap. 
Um, it's called Innovation on Tap, which means it's good if you want to read it while you're reading it, you have a beer or some wine, right? When, when we picked the title, I kind of got forced into the title by the publisher. I thought, oh no, everyone's going to think it's a, it's a history of Budweiser or something. But it worked out okay. And so the, in the bar room, um, hopefully will be fun for you. I'm not a fiction writer, but I put some words in the mouths of some of these entrepreneurs that I hope will help you. I do keep a blog, The Occasional CEO, where I, um, I slowed down a lot recently, but I have a bunch of stuff regarding the book if you want to do that. And please link in with me when you get a chance so we can stay in touch, okay? Thank you, everyone.